throat. All right, now that didn't bother me. We laughed about it, the squad laughed about it, and I felt good about that. I felt Joe good Paterno, the, the winningest college kind of football coach in the nation. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it. He looks thing, like the saxophone player at an Italian wedding. He sounds like Peter Falk before the diction lessons. Be honest with them. And his Those players affectionately call him the rat that I know that we have. when he's he not around. Exception, safety, he's the winningest college football coach in the nation. And he tells jokes, too. Back where I was in Brooklyn, that was a different problem. You know, safety and protection was the one thing you thought about going to school. Because I was an honor student. Yes, Your Honor, no, Your Honor, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Who is but Joe Paterno, really? Okay. Well, to listen to members of his coaching staff and a few current and former players, that's a fairly complex question. Coach Paterno? Or... Did you ever be asking me about Coach Paterno? Or what kind of person is uh, Coach Paterno? Or... Well, I'm a little crazy, that's what... <laughs> to be frank with you. Coach Paterno, uh, I... It's tough. It's tough. I can get emotional at times. Well, what kind of person is uh, Coach Paterno? Or he's a... Uh, 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 wait a minute. What did you say? Uh, Joe Paterno is very young. Uh, oh, stop it. Let me think about it. Uh, yeah, I think he's a pretty good coach. Some people used to refer to him as a rat. <laughs> but most of my coaching came from Coach Patrick. And then I looked at him one day and I said... Yes, he does <laughs> he resemble a rat, sort of. Oh, what kind of person is uh, Coach Paterno? Or... Browning said, I'm frustrated. Coach Paterno is a, not really a fatherly type. No, I don't think he's fatherly. and uh, I need steadier hands, maybe. I really don't think he's very a uh, disciplinary coach, either. Uh, he is a very easy person to work for. Coach Paterno is a, a fairly authoritarian type of person. And I don't particularly care whether I'm a brother or an uncle or what have you. I think his first approach to football is that he thinks that it should be enjoyable. It's a game. Enjoy it. At Penn State, football's supposed to be fun. I try to tell our kids that, look, love your opponents. Uh, he feels that football is fun. Well, I'm a little crazy. When you go into a game, you know that you never have to be afraid of not being prepared. But winning isn't everything. Well, what kind of person is uh, Coach Paterno? Or he's a... Uh... Well, I always thought he was going to be real good. <laughs> coach Paterno. Yeah. I'm a much different coach now than I was when I first started to be a head coach. Uh, Joe Paterno is very... Um... Uh... Oh. I'm not quite as violent as I used to be. I only heard him yell once. He sets up uh, his guidelines, but uh, they're not strict enough so that we won't fall with Coach Paterno. Or... Rip Engel used to say all the time... Yo, good. You know, Abraham Lincoln said, even this will pass. Coach Paterno likes to me, uh... Oh, you better cut that. Mamma mia! <laughs> well, it's obvious that Joe Paterno is many things. But it's also obvious that we've been having a little fun with him by taking these quotes out of context. Uh, now, we can do it, but the press better not. But that's still another side of Joe Paterno. You can have fun with him. And how many football coaches can you say that about? But as for capturing the real Paterno, let's just take one of those random quotes and, well, let's see, how about this one? He can't run and he can't pass. Now, let's listen to the entire quote, especially the part we left out. Joe couldn't run and he couldn't pass, but uh, all he could do was think and win. Well, actually, That's former Penn State head coach Charles Rip Engel reciting a quote from the late sports writer Stanley Woodward. Rip is talking about Joe Paterno's quarterbacking days at Brown University, where he and his brother George played for Rip and were popularly known as the Gold Dust Twins. Of course, uh, they were both good football players. Now, uh, Joe, he was a very adequate quarterback. He was a spirited runner. He only weighed 170 pounds. Uh, he followed instructions so well, and he was a quick thinker, and... Uh, he, a, he just was an outstanding young man, and he was always a resourceful player, and he, he just never gave up. Now, in our last game at Brown, I, I'll never forget it. Yeah, it Listen, many people think we're twins, and we're, we're not. He's older than me, and I make sure everybody knows that. First Joe's all, brother, George Paterno, a former running back and now the color analyst for the Penn State Football Television Network. 
high school, and therefore I continued on in high school. And then when he got out, we joined forces at Brown University under the beautiful guidance of Rib Angle. Joe, even at that age, had a great sense of responsibility. Uh, he always wanted to speak out of the uh, imperfections in the world and the problems and, and whatever, whatever. He's very well read. He was an English major. You know, using this vehicle, this became a natural uh, media for him to express these philosophies. And uh, A reader, a thinker, a classical music buff, a humanist, with an Ivy League degree in English literature, no less, an intellectual football coach, and even more improbable, a winning intellectual football coach. At Penn State, it's not, uh, they go after the student athlete. Uh, student Former athlete, student and, and football player Dan Wallace, now in real estate. They refer to them as prospective student athletes. I think it's good because it's cha changing the image of football. And that's what Joe is, he's an innovative coach uh, he's a real thinker, and maybe he came up with that term. I, so I think can't he, tell. They appreciate that. We try to sell them that they get the best of both worlds, that they can get an awfully fine education at Penn State, and number two, you can play on a great football team so that you can have the best of both worlds. And that takes a little bit more effort, but you get a lot more out of it. It's still, you don't have... Uh, you don't have football as your number one thing. Joe will always say in a meeting, he'll say, uh, fellas, you got three things to experience at Penn State. You have your academic life, you have your football life, and you have your social life. And once that's the exact order I want you to keep them in. An emphasis on academics. Praiseworthy, noble in fact, but does it answer the question? What is it about a reading, thinking, idealistic, romantic, humanist, and classical music buff that enables him to take student athletes and produce winning football teams. Well, maybe that question can be best answered by starting at the beginning of a season way back at spring practice, the incubation period really, when the unique paternal program of mind and bodybuilding first takes root, mainly through the daily ministrations of his coaching staff. Okay, all right, let's try it. Aiming point, that armpit. Still step with this foot, cross that, except you strike right here, and then as soon as you hit, you're thinking about raking, bring those hands, raking, and work vertically. Break. Sit. Hit. Now rake up, rake up, rake up, rake up, rake up. Coach Paterno has taught me as an assistant coach, well, he's taught me a number of things. Uh, he's taught me a great deal about the X and O's of football, about the uh, planning and the preparation. Uh, for different teams and the way we'll adjust our Can defenses. You do it? Are you sure? Are you sure? Yeah. Let's go. Set. Go. I feel that he looks to us as assistant coaches to try to evaluate what he plans to do and try to criticize and, and come up with maybe uh, just little different ways of uh, doing the same basic things that he's thinking about. Again, right there. Okay, that's better. Now get further back, get further back. Right there. Let's try it. Go ahead. Come on, under control. Okay, now let's get back. Go, go. Tighter, tighter, tighter. Go for the ball. Go for the football. All right, all right. That's not too bad. Hustle up. Hustle, hustle. Keep your head up. Keep He's up. also taught me what it takes probably to coach in the league as Penn State is in and the amount of work and dedication and the time you'll have to spend in preparation uh, for these games. Now screen, screen, screen! Head up, head up, head up! Oh. Uh, I believe Coach Paterno, the reason Coach Paterno has such good football teams here at Penn State is because of the ball players he gets uh, to come to school here come because they want to accept a challenge. Uh, the, reason... the thing I tell our people is this, look, fellas, 10 years from now, you guys may get together. Then you're going to start talking about the old coach. And you can, you'll say a lot of things about me. But you're never, ever going to get together and 
and sit around and say, you know what? Turner was a good guy, but, you know, he never realized how good we wanted to be. He never made us work hard enough to realize what great potential we had. We could have been great, but he didn't realize it. Right, those two guys come back. <clears throat> now, did you guys watch them? Did you watch that? You learn from one another now. All right, you learn from one another. Did Break. you watch him? Go, hit it! Go, go, tighter, tighter, tighter. In order to play man-to-man -man defense, you gotta move your feet. You're not moving your feet. Any kind of fast defense, you gotta be moving, okay? If you're standing still, they're gonna blow right by you. What kind of steps? Short, choppy steps. A thousand of them. Between there and there, a thousand of them. Move them. Balance that stance. Don't give anything away. On the whistle. You know where you are at that moment? Two. Flat on your back. Now, with football, you do not play on your back. Sometimes you're going to be knocked out of your back. you got to think about getting up. I'm going to sting them, okay? Maximum effort, okay, with a minimum amount of wasted motion. That's clinic talk. You like that? <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. We're going to take away the inside. We're not going to get beat deep, right? We're going to try and maintain a five-yard cushion at all times. Relax, relax. Now, under control. Under control. Hustle, hustle. Keep your head up. Keep driving. You're getting tired. Hustle. A good broken field runner doesn't get tired. I told the squad today, I said, I'm sick and tired of looking at you guys practice. I'm anxious to see you play. I know you guys are tired of practicing, and I'm tired of watching you practice. I'm tired of seeing drills and everything else. I'm anxious to see how they're going to play. Game time. That time when all the hard work, the discipline, the planning, and the practice pays off. This is the day when, according to Paterno, football is supposed to be fun. Former quarterback... The undefeated 1968 and 69 Penn State teams, Chuck Burkhart. As far as Paterno's views on football is fun, I think really what he wants to say is that the day of the game is fun. I think if you asked any of the players up there what practices were like, what preseason conditioning was like, that wasn't fun. Hey, look, You're there to... we're going to work as hard as we know how during the week, but when we play on site, we're going to enjoy it. It's only a game. It isn't life or death. It, this business about, you know, uh, winning is the only thing and that kind of nonsense is nothing. It's a game. Enjoy it. Get, get yourself ready for a strong confrontation. Pull up your pants and look the other guy in the eye and say, come on, let's go. And enjoy it. Now, and enjoyment it is when all the basics, the fundamentals, the little things, as Paterno likes to call them, have been taken care of. We like to tell our football team, do the little things right, and the big things will take care of themselves. And never was that sage counsel more rewarding than in the 1968 28-24 victory over Army. Coach Paterno told his team to take care of the little things, hustle, and sooner or later, something good would happen. But on this mild and windy homecoming afternoon at Beaver Stadium, it would be later, much later, before something really good would happen. With only two minutes and 29 seconds left in the game, the undefeated and fourth-ranked Nittany Lions held a precarious 22-17 lead over Army, a team that had beaten them four out of their last five encounters. Now, Army was set to kick off to the Lions, and Paterno, anticipating Army's penchant for the onside kick, had had his team preparing for it all week long. Again, the little things, the basics. Would they pay off here and now? Penn State's Fran Fisher describes the action. And they've closed the gap to 22-17, Penn State leading by five. The kickoff now with Arden Jensen kicking off for the cadets with two minutes and 29 seconds left in the ballgame. Don't be surprised if we don't get an onside kick here. And, of course, the way Army 
has bounced back in the late stages of this ball game. Penn State does not want to lose the football. Everybody's lined up now. The signal, and here comes Jensen. It is an onside kick, and it's loose 10 yards down the field. Dave Bradley has a shot at it. He can't get it. There's a pileup. The ball is still loose. I can't quite see. Wait a minute. Ted Qualick has picked up the ball. Ted Qualick picked up the ball at about the 45-yard line. He's got clear sailing. He goes all the way for a Penn State touchdown. And most of the players on that team returned the following year to fashion yet another undefeated season. Joe recalls that team with glowing praise. I would describe the 1969 Penn State team in two words, pride and poise. Pride to be the best and realization of what it takes to have poise, hard work and preparing well. Penn State versus Syracuse, Archbold Stadium, October 18, 1969. It's a homecoming game for the Orange Men, and if ever pride and poise were needed, it was at halftime when Uncots, Ham, Reed, Smear, Pittman, Serma, and Cates and company went into the locker room behind 14 to nothing. Quarterback Chuck Burkhart tells what happened next. Very quiet halftime, and Joe just really wanted us to go out there and not get embarrassed. And now again, you'd have to talk to him and whether he was using psychology or whether he was just stating the truth because we had not done anything for the first half and what really led to be the first three quarters of that game. Okay, that interference call against Syracuse gives Penn State renewed life. Fourth quarter action. Down. Paterno calls At on Team Pride, and sophomores Lydell Mitchell and Franco Harris respond. In the game. Listen now as Fran Fisher the reports the first score. 32-yard line after Jack Ham's fumble recovery. And Penn State down 14, wants to get on the board and on the board in a hurry. Okay, they're out over the ball. Chuck Burkhardt calls the signals again to Mitchell. Mitchell into the end zone. Touchdown. With 10-18 left in the fourth quarter. Sophomore halfback Lionel Mitchell. Bulls for four yards and six points. All right, the Lions lining up now for the extra point attempt. Apparently going for two. Franco Harris is into that backfield at fullback. They're quickly out over the ball. Here's the snap to Burkhardt. Franco Harris hit at the goal line. He does not get in. The two-point try is no good. Wait a minute. Wait a minute now. There's a flag on the play. And the preliminary indication is holding against Syracuse. So umpire Ed Meyer is consulting with offensive captain Tommy Jackson and quarterback uh, Burkhardt listening in. It's just a formality. Penn State will gladly take another shot at two points. It is a holding penalty against Syracuse. Defensive holding, so it's half the distance to the goal. And the Nittany Lions have another shot at it. They're huddling and come out very, very quickly. Chuck Burkhardt crouched under center, calling signals, takes the snap. It's Harris again, and he's into the end zone. A two-point conversion makes the score. Syracuse 14, Penn State 8. The undefeated Lions roared back from two touchdowns behind to win 15-14 to 14 in the fourth quarter. Along with pride and poise, another watchword at the foot of Mount Nittany and State College, Pennsylvania, is courage. And when you come right down to it, Courage may be the ultimate legacy that Joe Paterno yearns to impress on each and every member of his team. And isn't it just like Paterno to pick one of his least successful teams to best illustrate his interpretation of the word courage? When I think about the 1970 Penn State football team, I think about something Winston Churchill said. Churchill said, success is never final. Failure is never fatal. The only thing that counts is courage. And that's what the 1970 Penn State football team had, courage. Indeed, it was a courageous team, a team rebuilding after two astounding undefeated seasons, a team desperately trying to claw its way back after three convincing defeats in its first five games. Former All-American, Franco Harris. I think the big thing was when we lost to Colorado, we turned around the following week and lost to Wisconsin. And the 1970 team had a courageous coach as well. 
one willing to risk the predictable bitterness of starters benched, not only in favor of second stringers, but third stringers as well. One thing you learn in my business as a football coach, that a player will love you one day and hate you the next. But the next day, if, you, if you've proven to him that that really helped him, he'll love you for it. And John Huffnagel, then a sophomore third string quarterback, must have loved Joe Paterno on a cloudy day at West Point that year because it was Huffnagel's first start in a career that he would top off two years later as a first team All-American. While we're on the subject of firsts, listen to this play in the first quarter. Penn State moving the ball very well under John Huffnagel. And out over the ball they come with a third and three situation at the Army 32-yard line. Fran Ganter, Joel Ramick, and Gary Duell in the backfield along with Huffnagel. Here's the snap. Huffnagel keeps, moves to the left. He's going to turn up field on the option play. He's got blockers. He's at the 20, the 15, the 10, the 5. Penn State touchdown. The final score that day was Penn State 38, Army 14. But more important, as Joe Paterno said later, the team began showing pride again. It was a good year at all. Franco Harris. And uh, I guess sometimes you have years like that that tend to wake you up and uh, make you realize, hey, better get things together. You see, it's not a thing, I don't think, where you just play for yourself or play for the team. But you play for Penn State University. You play for the state of Pennsylvania. You know, you play for the East. You take a fellow like Franco Harris. I don't think I, I ever heard Franco ever in any way ever be critical of a teammate who may not have blocked for him or a quarterback who may not have thrown the ball correctly or anything like that. But any time any one of them have done anything to help him, he's been the first guy to go over to an offensive guard and say, that was a great block, Jack. At Penn State, there are no superstars. Oh, you'll have All-Americans. You'll have Maxwell Award winners and Red Worrell Award winners. And John Capaletti is a Heisman Trophy recipient. And Mike Reed won the Outland Trophy for his outstanding interior line play. But at Penn State, there are no superstars. Not Capaletti, not Reed, not Franco Harris, not Lydell Mitchell. They're all part of a team. We have some great, great athletes, but they're very modest. Effective. Most of them are very quiet. They've got a lot of poise, a lot of confidence, but they're almost on the shy side. One thing Paterno and his players are definitely not shy about is the subject of ties. And who better than former All-America quarterback, the riverboat gambler Rich Lucas, to describe Penn State's almost loathing aversion to the tie. I don't think winning's that important. I, I just, I think you participate, you do as well as you can, you come out as a winner or loser. But I, I think, and consequently, I don't think there's anything wrong with losing either. But I feel differently about a tie. I think if you had a chance to avoid a tie, you very definitely avoid a tie. And I just don't think that I would want to coach a football team if I had to play for the tie. I think that was definitely inbred in the ball players, the fact that you were there to win. And I think... Former quarterback Chuck Burkhart. Did, whether it's high school or college, that's got to stay with you and help you through life. One game where Coach Paterno went for the win instead of the tie was against Navy in 1974, and that risk resulted in a loss. The middies were tough in the mud and rain that day, and late in the fourth quarter, they led seven to nothing. Then Penn State scored a touchdown. Instead of going for the moral victory, the face-saving, no decision of a tie, Coach Paterno held back his excellent kicker, Chris Barr, and decided to go for the two-point conversion. All right, with a seven to six score now, no question but what Coach Joe Paterno is going to go for two and see if he can pull this ball game out. Penn State with Tom Schumann directing the attack. They're out over the ball, rolling right to pass, looking for Jerry Jerram, throws incomplete. I've always preached to my boys that there's one thing I want you to do, and that is don't ever be afraid to lose. Personally, I, I think I'd rather lose and say I tried to win than to tie and say I actually tried not to win. It's 
halftime. And head coach Joe Paterno has marched his troops back to the locker room, where every member of his team is attended to. When we go on a football field, everybody in our squad, everybody in our staff understands, hey, that's my time, you guys produce, everything's 100%. Okay, who you are, how good you are, everybody's trying to get better today. Don't go through the motions, Franco Harris, Lydell Mitchell. Hey, Capoletti, get that Italian nose of yours moving. We're going to get better. Everybody's going to get better. I think even in practice, Joe uh, keeps everything at a, a level that everybody's equal. You know? Everybody's on the team. We're all doing the same thing for the same Former defensive cause. tackle, Ron yeah. Coder. Uh, he's not going to let anybody try to be like kingpin over everybody else. He's going to make, make sure everybody's doing their job. Time's nearly over now. Paterno has gathered his team together for some last-minute maintenance. And before we go out, Joe says some uh, choice words, and then we go out. Larry Suey of the famous Suey family, three generations of football players and coaches, tells how Paterno communicates with them in the locker room. Sometimes he tries to psych us, other times he just tries to sell us down and, you know, get ready to play the ball game. I guess it depends on the uh, tempo out there. The big fear I have in coaching is that I'm going to lose a football game in half. That I'm going to get so emotionally involved in a football game that I'm going to walk in and say something that's going to be the wrong thing. So when I get ready for a football game, I have a speech ready if we're ahead. I have a speech ready if we're behind. And we may go into a halftime, such as we did at North Carolina State, and I knew we were in a tough game. And all because you guys all thought you had it made. What I have to think about was the game that, when I was still playing in 1973, was when the Capoletti years, you know, and uh, Huffnagel was a Once again, year. former I offensive sure tackle Dan Wallace. Year, that's right. And it was the uh, North Carolina State game. Former All-American, Heisman Trophy winner John Capoletti. I think it was probably one, if not the best game, you know, right up there at the top. Like I say, the thing that stands out the most is the... It's the way that, you know, one team had scored and then the other team had come back and was back and forth all day. It's fourth and goal now on the Lions one-yard line. The Wolfpacks, the Wolfpacks going to go for it. Of course, no field goal attempt. Bucky calling signals. Hands off to Stan Fritz. He's over the left side and he's into the end zone for the score. Chris Barr with a 23-yard field goal attempt. Not a biggie for Chris. There's the snap. There's the set. There's the kick. It's up. And it's good. The give is to Bob Nagel. He pops to the left side. Touchdown, Penn State. It's first and goal on the one-yard line. And the snap with Bucky to Fritz. Fritz straight ahead, and he's in for the score. Good kick. Good kick. Gary Heyman has to give ground. Backs up. Hauls it in at about the 39-yard line of Penn State. Starts down the left side. Looking for blockers. There's the wedge starting to form. Heyman cuts to the inside of midfield. Good blocking. Heyman's in the clear. Nobody near him. He's going to score. Just over uh, four minutes gone in the fourth quarter and what a ball game we've had Penn State 29 North Carolina State 22 quarterback Dave Bucky calling signals gets the snap it's a pitch out to Young he sweeps around the left side he breaks into the secondary he's got good blocking there's nobody near him he's going to go all the way he's at the 20 the 15 the 10 and in the end zone a 69 yard touchdown run for Charlie Young and a dog fight it was right down to the final minutes. The score, Penn State 35, North Carolina State 29. A six-point margin with less than two minutes on the clock. It's the Wolfpack's ball now on the Penn State 40-yard line. The snap, Dave Bucky back to pass. He's got a lot of time. He's got a man open in the end zone. It's Don Bucky. The pass broken up. A fine play by Jim Bradley. The Penn State defensive halfback came out of nowhere, and the pass is incomplete. There were some outstanding individual Lion achievements that day by Jim Bradley, as you just heard, 
by wide receiver Gary Heyman, who returned one kickoff 48 yards and ran back punts for a total of 122 yards, the most ever in a Penn State game. But there was another outstanding effort, courtesy of John Capoletti, who ran for a total of 220 yards that day. Come on, John, run! What was the last one you hit, uh, Capoletti? Was that the slug three? Slug three, two. Yeah, that was a good coach. Tell Capoletti he didn't run it right, though. The handoff to John Capoletti off the right side. He breaks one tackle. He's into the secondary. Shakes another tackle. Two blockers in front of him. He's going all the way. A 34-yard touchdown run for John Capoletti. And off to Cappy, he's up the middle, breaks to his right, fakes one man, cuts back against the green, touchdown! And my friend, that puts Cappy over 200 yards on the afternoon. John Capoletti, All-American, second in career rushes at Penn State with a total of 2,639 yards. And this after only two seasons as a running back and the only football player in the history of the university to receive the John W. Heisman Memorial Trophy, awarded annually to the outstanding intercollegiate football player in the United States, and perhaps the best glimpse into the personality of this exceptional young man came on the very night he received the Heisman. I know my mother always cries at the, these affairs, so uh, I'm going to try not to. Um, a lot of people may have noticed that my, my legs are as straight as arrows and that uh, I have no trouble walking now or running now, but at one time in my life I, I couldn't walk without tripping. And uh, my mother uh, not only brought me through this, but uh, she brought just about every member of our family through something like this. Um, I'm very happy to, to do something like this. I thought about it since the Heisman was announced 10 days ago. And this is a dedicated trophy that a lot of people have earned. I've earned, my parents, the people I've mentioned, and numerous other people that are here tonight and been with me for a long time. The youngest member of my family, Joseph, is uh, very ill. He has leukemia. And if I could dedicate this trophy to him tonight, and give him a couple days of happiness. This is worth everything. Later in the evening, when His Excellency Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen was called on to pronounce the benediction, he said, there's no blessing required tonight. God has already blessed you in John Capaletti. Most of it has to be attributed to Penn State because, you know, it gave me the opportunity to do all the things that I did, and it gave me the the people. And you know, as far as the Paterno is concerned, uh, there's not much you can say about him that you know you haven't already heard. Uh, and if a kid does have a problem, he can go to Paterno maybe more easily than he can to his father sometimes. New Year's Day, 1972, the Cotton Bowl. The Nittany Lions of Penn State versus Darrell Royals' tough Texas Longhorns. Get two downs and make your first. Now look, you guys got to put a drive together. Now let's see if you got a little class and you get a good drive together. Good hit, 47. All right, lots of big good hit. I'm for the defense today. Good job, Hager. Oh! Come on, Eddie, be tough out there now. The attendance. 72,000 on hand, and countless millions at home, all watching the likes of Huffnagel, Joyner, Donchez, Duquette, Harris, Zapek, and some guy at defensive halfback named John Capoletti. It was an historic day for the Nittany Lions. Before ex-president Lyndon Johnson, a Longhorn super fan, Paterno and company fashioned their most convincing upset ever, beating Texas 30 to six. But the man of the hour was Lydell Mitchell. The snap. Huffnagel to Mitchell. He hits the right side. Gets a block from Bobby Nichol. Cuts to the outside. Over the safety Mike Bear in front of him. And Bear nails him at the 22-yard line. At the Texas 22, a 19-yard game now for Lydell Mitchell. Mitchell on the Texas one. The Lions need this score to go ahead. The snap. Mitchell over Joyner on the right side. Touchdown. Seven minutes, eight seconds left in the fourth quarter as the Lions break from the huddle. John Huffnagel calling the signals. The snap. A pitch to Mitch. Over the line of scrimmage for five. Checks one tackle. Cuts to the outside. And finally run out of bounds. 
gain of 14 yards for Lydell Mitchell. That uh, fumble recovery by Greg Ducat gives the Lions the ball on the Longhorns 43 yard line. First and 10 for the Nittany Lions on the move and out they come over the ball. Johnny Huffnagel gets the snap a pitch to Mitchell hits the left side he breaks through fights his way all the way down to the uh, 33 yard line close to a first down. Not outstanding guys. Um, it's offensively uh, uh, Dave Joyner on the offensive line, uh, Bob Neckner, uh, Franco in the backfield, um, Huff Nagel. And these are some of the key guys, but uh, it was an exciting game. Uh, it's just the fact that uh, Penn State was playing against a team as great as Texas. Just beating those guys was fun. You know, I wish we could have played another game the same day. At Penn State, there are no superstars. They're all part of a team. Rip Engel used to say all the time, he'd say, hey, fellas, it's not our team. It's their team. Those guys are only going to go through college once. They're only going to play on four college football teams. They've got a, a right and a privilege to make that four years and those four teams they're on as meaningful as possible for them. Not for me. I mean, that's how I'm getting paid. Maybe it's this attention, this responsiveness to every individual on the team that has made Joe Paterno so acute to the special skills, the forts, if you will, of each individual athlete on the team. He is uncannily adept at making adjustments that most improve their attitude, morale, confidence in themselves, and consequently, their worth to the team. The adjustments have been many. Item, All-American Steve Smear. High school tight end, switched to tackle at Penn State. Item, all-pro, all-American Mike Reed, a fullback in high school, switched to tackle at Penn State. And perhaps the most rewarding item of all, all-American John Capaletti, yep, the Heisman Trophy winner, thankfully spirited out of the defensive backfield at the end of his sophomore year and happily inserted at offensive halfback where he reigns supreme for the next two seasons. The adjustments are many, but how about this one? No, when I was at uh, Bishop McCord in Johnston, I was a uh, offensive tackle and... Uh... Recognize the voice? Probably not. But you never would have recognized the name either if he had continued languishing at offensive tackle. I think Paterno even tells a funny story of the fact that if uh, he was recruiting me for... Uh, Offensive tackle, I'd still be in Johnstown right now. <laughs> it's Jack Ham, an All-American at Penn State, an All-Pro linebacker for the world champion Pittsburgh Steelers, happy to be out of a role in which he was hopelessly miscast. I can really attribute a lot of my success in, in, uh, in my college years and in pros to Paterno. Uh, I had a real confidence problem, like I said before, with not playing very much in high school and uh, not thinking of myself as a very good football player. And, so, Paterno uh, took a supremely talented young athlete and put him where his abilities would be best utilized and appreciated. Another key to Joe Paterno's and Penn State's winning ways is the handicap. As a gambler, Paterno's always looking for the edge, that little idiosyncrasy that always shows up somewhere in the opposing team's game films that little something that he can capitalize on when least expected. Maybe it's Paterno's intense devotion to detail. Nothing escapes him. Jack Ham tells this story. I can remember uh, Franny Ganner, who's now on the staff up there, and we were practicing in the Penn State field. They have two huge practice fields up there, and Paterno was just walking around to all the different stations, you know, from the running backs to the linebackers to the offensive linemen, and just kind of circling the field and... and uh, Franny told me a story that he made a mistake on a running play with the offensive backs. He either hit the hole wrong or he took the handoff wrong. And Paterno was something like 60 yards away, and he was giving Franny hell. And Fran, <laughs> Fran told me, he said, how could Paterno see me from 60 yards away and know that I made a mistake? He said, you can't get away from on this field. But, uh, a boy. stickler for detail, always looking for the edge. And that carries over to a coaching staff that Fran Ganter is now a part of. For instance... During the 1975 edition of the Pitt Penn State Showdown, it was assistant coach Greg Duquette who took a page from Paterno's handicap manual. While watching the Pittsburgh game films earlier in the week, 
Duquette spotted the Panthers' center hitching his shoulders a little just before centering the ball. Not very much, but just enough to possibly turn it to Penn State's advantage sometime during the game. Duquette apprised linebacker Tom O'Dell of the situation. And here's what happened. Second quarter action. Pitt's Elliott Walker has just burst through the middle for a 37-yard touchdown run. Carson Long is back to kick the extra point. Carson Long in there, of course, to attempt the extra point. There's the snap, the kick, and it's blocked! Defensive halfback Tom O'Dell, I believe it was, just leaped over the center and blocked the extra point attempt. So, with six minutes and six seconds left in the first half, it's Pitt six, Penn State nothing. Well, we're nearing the end of our second half now, and throughout all the game highlights we've been reliving today, I think we can clearly perceive the unique paternal philosophies and principles finding physical expression between the goal lines. The traditions of poise and confidence upheld in the 1969 Syracuse game, when the undefeated Lions roared back from two touchdowns behind to win 15 to 14 in the fourth quarter. The continuing recommitment to the basics, the little things, best exemplified by Ted Qualick's onside kick recovery for the winning touchdown in the 68 Army game. The necessary elements of aggressiveness and reckless enthusiasm, the vigilant suppression of the superstar syndrome, the constant probing of the imagination, all these positive goals and principles have been elevated to the level of a palpable, physical reality at some time or another during the course of a season. But if one game could be pointed to which seemed to embody all of Paterno's credos at work at one time, most observers of the man and his team would single out the 1969 Orange Bowl game, Penn State versus Kansas. Third-ranked Lions came into this game 10-0 on the season, and they hadn't lost in 18 straight outings. They had broken five school records that year, and they started six first-team All-Americans. Reed, Oncotts, Qualick, Pittman, Neil Smith, and Jack Ham. Not to mention Chuck Burkhart, Steve Smear, Bobby Campbell, Paul Johnson, Pete Johnson, and Jim Cates. But this would be a game of games because Kansas had such luminaries as quarterback Bobby Douglas and halfback John Riggins. Let us go now to the closing moments of the game with Kansas out ahead 14 to 7. A minute and 16 seconds remain on the scoreboard clock. Penn State ball on the 50-yard line. Joe Paterno calls quarterback Burkhart and halfback Bobby Campbell over to the sidelines. Chuck Burkhart takes it from there. So we called what we thought was our best shot to get a big game. And Kansas normally played a man-to-man, -man, so you didn't have to worry about a lot of extra people. And that pass pattern, with that in mind, you knew that Bobby Campbell had to beat one guy and I had to get a ball to him. Fortunately for us, we avoided the rush long enough to throw a good pass, and Bobby Campbell made an exceptional catch on it. Campbell was brought down on the Kansas three-yard line. It's third and goal now, as NBC's Jim Simpson and Al DeRogatis describe what may be the most thrilling finale in Penn State football history. Once again, the score. Kansas 14, Penn State 7, 20 seconds in the game, third down and three yards for the touchdown. Good chance with the pitch. 20 seconds to go, third down. Burkhart keeps the football himself. Touchdown! Oh. As L.D. were going to said, the middle was jammed up. Burkhart left to the outside. Touchdown. And there's, there's a situation now. You see a great fake by Bobby Campbell in the middle. The bootleg was open earlier, but this time Burkhart comes with a number 22. They may say, and Joe Paterno, uh, Paterno has said that this guy may not look great, but he sure does it when you need it. They're going to win the football game. They're not settling for a tie. This is the extra point conversion, the extra two that could win it for Penn State, or if they fail, for Kansas. Burkhart. 
throws it in the air, up in the air. It is no good with 15 seconds left. Kansas has held. And may I congratulate Joe Paterno. 10 and 0 is almost as bad as a 10 and a tie. They're waving a flag at the goal line. Hold on. This madness of the 35th annual Orange Bowl isn't over yet. Joe Paterno said that, uh, as Pepper Rogers has, that college football must be fun. You don't play that many games. And Joe Paterno, we congratulate him. He plays to win. And this is for everything. 14 to 13, the conversion attempt. If successful, we'll set it up again. We'll win for Penn State. If unsuccessful, we'll win for Kansas. The official, Earl Jansen, the referee, stepping in. Now, you've got to remember that Penn State is on the near side, down at this end of the field. Reed, whose two tremendous defensive plays have set up this opportunity, is praying on the sideline. Burkhardt hands to Campbell. He's won it! So how best do you sum up a go-for-everything individual like Joe Paterno? Well, we'd like to do it the way we did it in the beginning. Fellas? He's a, a very intelligent man, smart. He was a very, very smart student. He tries to stay on top of everything. He gives you some type of philosophy to live by. He has to be like a, sort of like a father to us during that uh, preseason. And he has to be a psychologist with us during the year. He has to be like a teacher to us for school. As far as the paterno is concerned, uh, there's not much you can say about him that you know you haven't already heard. The more I, I get to know him, the less I want to hang labels on him, even good ones. Joe's high school Latin teacher, the very Reverend Thomas Birmingham, S.J., has this to say about Joe. One of the most remarkable things about Joe, I think, and uh, one reason why you know, I've never felt disposed to take any credit for Joe is that uh, when I first met him uh, 33 years ago, uh, in a sense, he was already all there. Uh, he was already uh, the Joe that, that you know today. I went to Rome, never been to Rome. The only person I wanted to see was my Latin teacher from high school because he had such a great influence on me. And as we left, He's a priest, Father Birmingham, a Jesuit priest. He put his arm around me and said, you know, he said, every once in a while, I get awfully lonely. He said, then somebody like you comes in back into my life and makes me feel that everything was worthwhile. He said, thank you. And I said to him, I said, what a joy, what a joy to know that you've had something to do with making some human being a little bit better. <laughs> 